Welcome to the fifth talk in the Discovering Our Dignity series. We've been spending some time in the New Testament, starting with the Blessed Mother and the Poor Widow, and now a woman that I feel so much affinity towards. Someone who I think gets some hard knocks in the Bible, but someone I relate to. We're going to get to know Martha. I encourage you to open your study guides to Lesson 18, where you'll find your outline, rooms for notes, and discussion questions. I'm assuming that you've read Luke 10 verses 38 through 42 because it gives important background for this talk. If you haven't, I encourage you to hit pause and go skim that passage. Before we talk about Martha, I have to share with you an experience that made me feel like I was bonding with Martha across the centuries. It was the tiniest thing that set me over the edge. It was just a little comment and one that I could have easily overlooked but it came on the heels of too many weeks of service that had left me maxed out and without any time to regroup and refresh. I had overcommitted again. My year had been full of exciting opportunities of growth with Walking With Purpose and my days were full of writing and speaking engagements. I wasn't able to volunteer in my kids' school as much as I would have liked, but I knew that the month of May was going to be calmer in terms of the commitments made to Walking With Purpose, so that could be my month of turbo service at school. Without thinking things through, I'd committed to serving on a committee of three women who put on our high school's graduation ceremony and after party, hosting a tea party for all the juniors and seniors and their mothers in my home, hosting a cast party for my daughter's play at our house with 100 in attendance, preparing the food and running a World War II event for my son's history class, and hosting the entire sixth grade class for an end of the year party in our yard, and I didn't even have a sixth grader. To make matters worse, all these things were scheduled for the same week, and Leo was out of town for most of it. The day after the last event, I was flying to Europe for a three-week school trip with one of our children. This was clearly a recipe for disaster. I knew it was going to be tough, so I determined to grip my teeth, get it all done, and not complain. All the while, I promised myself and my family and God that I would never, ever get into a situation like this again. And I was doing okay until the comment. It started with a phone call from a fellow parent at school. Are you planning on having a candy bar at the graduation party this year? Absolutely, I enthused, and I got ready to hear some words of encouragement, perhaps some reminiscence about how lovely it had looked the year before. Instead, she said, I cannot think of a worse idea. I was so shocked, and I replied, but everybody loved it last year. She said, that just means that people weren't telling you what they really thought. I'm sure no parents were thanking you when they got home with kids jazzed up on too much sugar. I could not have gotten off the phone fast enough. I had been hoping for recognition, a little thanks, perhaps an offer of help, and instead had been criticized. How I related to Martha. Lord, I said, couldn't you prompt her heart to help a little instead of just sitting there and critiquing my efforts? It all went downhill from there. Suddenly, I began to notice everything I was doing that was not resulting in acknowledgement or praise. I dwelled on all the people who could be helping, but instead were doing other things. And my annoyance spilled over to everyone at home, where I became overly sensitive to every item left on the floor, every job left undone, and every request for additional help. We had the candy bar at graduation. All the other events went ahead and turned out well. The results might have been beautiful, but my heart wasn't. I did much of the work with gritted teeth and the heart of a martyr. I know that when we read Luke 10, Martha is not the hero of the story. The one we're supposed to emulate is Mary, who chose the better part. But something in me always cries out, but if we all were just like Mary, who would serve on the committees? Who would clean up after everyone? Who would keep the churches running so people could go there to pray? For all of her faults, Let's at least acknowledge that Martha got the job done. I really relate to Martha. Do you? Do you find it hard to say no to requests for help? Do you find yourself committed to so many areas of serving and then skate close to burnout as a result? The answer for you and for me is not found in my earlier example of serving in every area that requires help. We need to have balance. Our service needs to be fueled and sustained by the Holy Spirit and we need to learn to listen to the Lord's guidance so that we commit to the things He's calling us to, not everything we are asked to do. That is what Mary did so well. 
In her wonderful book, Renewal on the Run, Jill Briscoe writes, it's a great release to know that the secret to doing it all is not necessarily doing it all, but rather discovering which part of the all God has given us to do and doing all of that. It's a matter of saying no in order to say yes to God. Donald Cousins wisely said, when falling under my burden, I ask, if his burden is light and his yoke is easy, then whose burden am I carrying? So how do we do it? How do we choose the better part, worship God, and still get done the things that really need to get done? Perhaps we'll come closer to finding the balance between resting at the Lord's feet and never moving and being his hands and feet in our hurting world by purifying our motives and making sure that we live with enough margin to be available to the master's call. Jesus is our example in this. He didn't respond to every need or demand, and he told his disciples, I only do what the Father tells me to do. Jesus discerned what the Father was telling him to do through his prayer life. It works the same way for us. When we're asked to serve, we can say, I'd love to help. I think I can arrange it, but let me pray about it and get back to you. God asks us to serve others because we are to emulate Jesus and be a servant, as he was. In Matthew 20, 26 through 28, Jesus said, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And St. Paul continued with that teaching in Philippians 2.3 when he wrote, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. We are called to serve unselfishly, and we are to do it with balance, saying yes to the things that God is calling us to, not just every need that comes our way. But even when we are serving in the areas that God has called us to serve, it can still be hard. We can still experience a struggle as we serve others. I'd like to highlight two of the most common struggles in service and hopefully give us encouragement for when we'll encounter them. The first struggle, it's hard to serve with no recognition. Martha had a teachable spirit, and when Jesus told her that Mary had made the better choice, she responded beautifully. We later see her transformation when we study John 11 and the raising of Lazarus. But immediately following his words, if I had been Martha, I would have inwardly felt hurt that my service in the kitchen had not been recognized. When we're busy serving, we can be fueled by just one word of encouragement or acknowledgement of what we are contributing. But what of the countless times that we serve and no one notices? It's hard to serve with no recognition. Nicole Johnson writes of the way mothers struggle with this in her book, The Invisible Woman, When Only God Sees. She begins by describing a mother walking into a room and no one in the family noticing. She'd say something like, turn down the TV, please, and nothing would happen. She'd say it again a little louder, but no one would move. She described walking her son to school and encountering someone who asked, who is that with you? Only to hear her son reply, nobody, that's just my mom. She put dinner on the table and everyone acted as if it appeared from nowhere. She began to conclude that no one could see her, that she was, in effect, invisible. This was, of course, very discouraging. Her life felt meaningless. She felt worthless until a friend gave her an unusual gift, a book about the building of cathedrals. In much of the book, the work of building a cathedral was described as all-consuming and demanding. And for most of the builders and artists, the final result of their work would not be seen completed in their lifetimes. She wrote the following about the upper chapel of Saint-Chapelle in Paris. The stained glass windows of Saint-Chapelle hold enough colored pieces to illustrate 1,100 biblical stories that are depicted there. These works of art were created by 30 master glaziers all unknown, who labored for more than six years on just the windows. Fifteen times taller than they are wide, these jewel-like pictures illustrate the biblical stories that animated the glaziers' hearts and minds. They created, sacrificed, and worked invisibly, hoping and perhaps even boldly trusting that their work would bring glory and honor to God. Near the end of the book, the writer expresses his belief that no cathedrals could be built in our lifetime because there are so few people who would be willing to sacrifice to that degree. It makes me wonder if there are fewer and fewer people who have a faith that can inspire such greatness. 
Some of those workers, like the anonymous stained glass artist, had no idea of the impact their work would have as it played the role of picture book, becoming the first Bible some people ever saw. Many never saw their finished glass placed in its final home in the cathedral. But they must have known that when people looked through their windows, they would see the world differently. So they sacrificed and created a bigger picture than they themselves could see. My mind was trying to grasp just how much these builders had to teach me, to teach all of us. They definitely understood sacrifice in a way that we no longer do. They believed enough in the greatness of their purpose to show up day after day at a job that they would never see finished, to work on a building that their name would never be on, trusting that by their selfless efforts they were making a lasting contribution to the world. I closed the book and sat alone for some time. I wanted to hold it all in my heart. It was almost as if I heard God say, I see you. You are not invisible to me. I see the sacrifices you make every day. I miss nothing. No act of kindness. No peanut butter sandwich made. No shoe selection is too small for me to notice and smile over. I see your tears of disappointment when things don't go the way you want them to. But you are building a great cathedral. You cannot possibly see right now what it will ultimately become. It will not be finished in your lifetime and you will never be able to live there. But if you build it well, I will. Much of the service we provide goes unseen and unrecognized. Instead of letting this discourage us, we must keep our eyes on what we are building. If we need to see the results right away, we'll get discouraged and quit. But if we can lift our focus to the fact that God is doing something incredible through us that will bring Him glory, we'll find the strength to persevere. We need to check our motives though, because nothing burns us out faster than serving for the wrong reasons. Why we serve is as important as how we serve. Jan Johnson, the author of Living a Purposeful Life, suggests the following questions to help us check our motives in service. She asks, one, am I serving to impress anyone? Two, am I serving to receive external rewards? Three, is my service affected by moods and whims? Four, am I using this service to feel good about myself? Five, am I using my service to muffle God's voice demanding that I change? Our motives really matter. Why we do what we do matters. In the words of Brother Lawrence, our holiness does not depend upon changing our works, but in doing that for God's sake, which we commonly do for our own. There's a difference between being a servant and serving. When I serve, I decide at a particular time that I will do a particular thing. I am in control. Tomorrow I may or may not serve, depending on the circumstances. By contrast, a servant is available whenever the master calls for whatever the master needs. In Matthew 20, 26, Jesus says that if we want to become great, we must become servants. And who is our master? Our master is God. This means that we are called to be available whenever He calls for whatever He needs. Which brings us to the next point and the next struggle. It's hard to serve when the needs are never ending. We are all surrounded by genuine needs that require time and attention. When God is in our hearts, our hearts become softer and more in tune to the needs of others. His Spirit in us fills us with compassion, and it makes it hard to not say yes to every opportunity to make a difference in the world. Yet doing so would mean that we would run at breakneck speed and burn out. If we were to compare life today with life a hundred years ago, we'd agree that much progress has been made. We're grateful for our dishwashers, clothes dryers, and highways that cut down on travel time. In his excellent book, Margin, Dr. Richard Swenson writes, for every hour progress saves by organizing and technologizing our time, it consumes two more hours through the consequences, direct or indirect, of this activity. Because this fact is counterintuitive and subtle, we do not recognize it as happening. People are submitting themselves to time-devouring technology. We get there faster, but we have more places to go. We have gadgets to help us clean more efficiently, but we have more things that need cleaning. Dr. Swenson makes the point that it all started out with good intentions. 
We didn't know that burning fossil fuels would bring acid rain. We didn't know that creating suburbs would throw off our traffic patterns. We didn't know that providing government housing in the inner city would create ghetto war zones. Many of the crises of the present have positive origins, explain scientists Masarovic and Pastel in Mankind at the Turning Point. They are consequences of actions that were, at their genesis, stimulated by man's best intentions. Just as today's crises caused by progress started with good intentions, when we get to a place of burnout and overload, we can look back and see that we started with good intentions too. But a good beginning, even with pure motives, doesn't ensure a good and balanced end. So many people today are stressed, overloaded, and unhealthy, and our relationships are suffering. Years ago, I took a trip with my husband and two of our children to Zambia, Africa. We went in order to find projects that we could be a part of to help the Zambians progress to a better standard of living. And we certainly saw many opportunities to do that. Villages that needed clean water. Their water was infected with typhoid, but they had kept drinking it as they had no choice. Schools that needed school supplies. The children were using razors as pencil sharpeners. One priest was shared among 28 parishes, and the people were able to receive the Eucharist once or twice a year. Unquestionably, there were needs. But they had something that we lack in the United States. Their wealth lies in their relationships. They are very affectionate with their friends. And although there's a lot of work to do, there is more time for friendship. They weren't distracted by technology. People were fully present in the moment. None of us want to give up our clean water, air conditioning, or cars. We all are grateful for progress and opportunity, but we need to find a way to build margin into our lives if we want to remain healthy in terms of body and relationship. Margin is the opposite of overload. It means that we have a buffer of time, money, and energy, so that if God sends something unexpected our way, we can welcome it. It means that instead of planning every minute of our day and filling it with activity, we leave some time unscheduled. Almost everything we do takes longer than expected, so we're wise to build in a buffer. It means that we set a budget, starting with a number that is lower than what we actually have, so that if the unexpected happens, we have the money in reserve. It means that we take time for quiet. Turning off the TV, turning off the phone, turning off the radio, we rest. If we want to experience margin, we're going to need to develop the virtues of contentment and simplicity. I found it interesting that in many of the African villages we visited, the children and adults were fascinated with our digital cameras. We were constantly asked to take their pictures and then to show them what they looked like. As it turned out, most of them don't own mirrors. Imagine a life with no mirrors. Just think how much we would grow in contentment if what we looked like wasn't such an issue. If instead of dwelling on the people who have more than we do, we would focus on those that have less. We'd grow in contentment. Henry Kissinger had this to say about contentment. To Americans, usually tragedy is wanting something very badly and not getting it. Many people have had to learn in their private lives and nations have had to learn in their historical experience that perhaps the worst form of tragedy is wanting something badly, getting it, and finding it empty. If only we would really take to heart this truth. We think that we'd be so much happier if we had whatever thing we lack. But if we were to get it all, we'd find that it was pretty empty. Things don't fill us the way that relationships do. We know this, but we so often don't live like this. Simplicity is another way to create margin in our lives. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus said, Don't stir up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and decay destroys, and thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor decay destroy, nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. When we simplify, when we have less things to take care of, when we reduce the amount of time our minds are numbed by passive entertainment, we'll find that a sense of wonder will return. We'll start to be delighted by simple things. We'll have fewer activities on our plates and more time to anticipate them and then to enjoy the memory afterwards. Leo and I noticed that we had started taking less and less photos and think that maybe it has something to do with our busyness. Instead of looking forward to events and then relishing the memory of them afterwards, 
We're often just glad that we made it through and got where we needed to go. That's not simplicity. That's not living with margin. We can pursue simplicity in terms of activities and we can pursue emotional simplicity. What do I mean by that? It's been said that there are three kinds of people, those that fill you, those that drain you, and those that just sit there. The way we manage our relationships will either max us out or energize us. It's worth taking a look at our relationships and recognizing which camp people fall into. When we're in a season where physically we are taxed, it's probably not a good idea to be spending loads of time with people who drain you. We need to create healthy boundaries and live within them. Giving grace is another way to pursue emotional simplicity. Judging and not forgiving is a heavy weight to carry. When we harbor bitterness and don't forgive, we are the ones who suffer most. They may not deserve your forgiveness, but you desperately need to grant it for your own sake. Serving, even in the areas that God has called us to serve, doesn't exempt us from struggle. We may wrestle with lack of recognition and we may become overwhelmed by never-ending needs. When we get overloaded, when we get overwhelmed, when we get overextended, we need to experience a turnaround. Otherwise, we'll collapse under the weight of expectations, to-dos, and guilt. Martha discovered this and experienced a turnaround of her own. She'd been overwhelmed with too many tasks and not enough assistance, and her work wasn't being recognized. Jesus' words to her turned her around, and her life was never the same. When we see Martha again in John 11, 21 through 27, she is a very different woman. Martha and Mary were grief-stricken as they dealt with the death of their brother, Lazarus. What made matters worse was Jesus' delay in coming to help. Yet when Christ came, Martha responded to her disappointment with faith. And this is what she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. And Martha was then able to witness her beloved dead brother coming back to life. Martha hadn't given up her personality and she continued to serve by using her gift of hospitality. But she had lost her frantic, resentful edge and she became a woman full of grace and trust. Jesus' words had made all the difference. They can make all the difference in our lives as well. We've talked about motives and virtues that can help us to purify our service, keeping it faith-filled and pleasing to God. But I'd like to close by offering a little tool that visually encourages us to turn around our times of struggle in service through God's Word. So we say, it's hard to serve with no recognition. This card has those very words written on one side. And if we're honest, these words reflect the way we feel sometimes. But when we want to turn around our thinking, we can turn around this card and read the following. Psalm 17, 4, you see those who do right. Others may not notice all the things that you do behind the scenes, but God sees. And he is delighted by humble service that goes unrecognized. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 3, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. The service that pleases him most is the service that goes unrecognized by the people around you. And if you feel that those you are serving don't deserve what you are giving them, the next verse will be helpful. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Ephesians 6, 7. You are playing for an audience of one. Who is that audience? It is God. Behave as if His approval is all that matters, because that is the truth. We say it's hard to serve when the needs are never ending, and this second card has those words written on them. When we want to turn around our thinking, we can turn around this card and claim the following scripture, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, 
like a spring whose waters never fail. Isaiah 58, 11. When we become overwhelmed by the needs of others, we often stop refueling and we begin to run on fumes. Soon we find ourselves empty. The secret is turning to the Lord, asking Him to satisfy your needs. When you are a well-watered garden, you have the resources to meet the needs of those around you. Those waters will never fail. They'll overflow into the lives of others. But if we don't live with margin, if we don't stop and take the time to rest at the feet of Christ, we'll burn out. This verse will serve to remind us of where we need to go when we feel overwhelmed by service. Ignoring this important truth is at the root of much of our burnout and ineffective service. When we ignore the need to slow down and refuel, we are saying to God, I can do this on my own. This is the opposite of the way that we should be doing things. If we want to do God's work in His way, then we must take the time to draw on the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Anything less than that is relying on our own strength. And that service, while it may provide results, will never be what pleases God. I love 2 Corinthians 9, 8, which says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. After God refreshes us, we can pour into the lives of those we love. We must remember that we are not the source or the solution for those who are struggling. God is. We will not be able to meet every need that we encounter. But as we slow down and spend time with God, He'll make clear to us which needs He wants us to meet. And He'll give us the strength and the power to do what's needed. He is the source of our strength, the secret of our service. Give yourself fully to God, wrote St. Teresa of Calcutta in Life in the Spirit. He will use you to accomplish great things on the condition that you believe much more in His love than in your own weakness. I also love her quote in Malcolm Muggeridge's book, Something Beautiful for God, when she says, Our activity is truly apostolic only insofar as we permit Him to work in us and through us with His power, with His desire, with His love. We must become holy, not because we want to feel holy, but because Christ must be able to live His life fully in us. She's a modern day example of a woman with a merry heart serving with the tenacity of Martha. May we follow her example. Will you pray with me, please? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, in the busyness of our days, I pray that we would avoid the two extremes. One, being leaving the service and work for you to someone else, and the other, thinking that if there's a need, it must have our name on it. In between there lies the balance. In between there lies a place where you want us to be spending our time and offering our yeses and our service. Help us to prioritize more than anything time with you so that we know which are the things that you are calling us to do. And when we recognize what those are, I pray that we would give our wholehearted yes to them and that everything we do, we would do out of our own weakness, out of our own emptiness, because we have asked you to fill us and do the work and do the loving through us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.